Hello, welcome. Hope you're excited to learn some field sketching tips. Just wait for people to kind of filter in. I'm Anna and I'll be teaching today. So if you have um, some supplies with you to draw along, I'll just recommend a few. Um, definitely a pencil and paper are like the minimum supplies, but also if you want to just kind of follow along and watch, that's totally fine too. And then this is going to be recorded so you can watch later whenever you want and you can, you know, rewind and pause to look back on tips and also colored pencils. So I have a nice set of colored pencils here. Uh, mostly, you know, when I'm drawing birds, I'm going to be using a lot of different shades of grays and browns. But we're also drawing a green heron today. So, have a nice array of greens, yellows, and some blues and violets as well. Um, a lot of people also enjoy using watercolors in the field, so... Um, if you're interested in watercolor tips, John Muir Laws has some really good ones. Um, and an eraser is definitely good to have. I know I do a lot of erasing. <laughs> and a pen could be useful to you as well. So, um, if you want to go out in the field and you don't want to carry a whole lot of colored pencils with you, this is one of my favorite brands of pen, Precise B5. And you can... You can get them at pretty much like any drugstore. At least here in the US. I think you can probably get them in other countries too. And then an electric eraser is really cool for when you're using colored pencils. So you just press this little button here and it's battery powered. And it does a really nice job erasing colored pencils. And I may review some of these supplies in a moment, too. I just want to make sure everyone has a chance to get here. But today we're going to be drawing this peregrine falcon. And also, we'll probably actually start off with this one because it's a little more complex in plumage. This is a green heron. And a snow bunting. So I wanted to get some nice variety going here. This class is going to be um, about an hour and a half long. And yes, um, I, I hope that everyone will have a chance to go out tomorrow or maybe later today, depending on where you are in the world or tonight if you're interested in owling, um, and participate in Global Birding Weekend. So this is a conservation event and fundraiser, and it's a birding big day. So this class is meant to help you with some tips so you can go out and do some field sketching and then share your observations, which you can do um, on social media by including the hashtag Global Birding. Okay, it's 12, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started, or it could be a different time depending on where you are. Let's see. So we're going to begin just by talking a little bit about some basic general field sketching tips. Um, I, I mentioned some of the supplies. Another helpful thing to have is one of these right in the rain field notebooks. And these can be ordered online or you can get them, you know, at some outdoor stores and things like that or bird watching stores. And these are really great because they actually are all weather field notebooks. <laughs> So when you're sketching in them, even if it's pouring down rain, and I have, I have done this before when I've been out in the field, 
you still will be able to write in it. And if it's really pouring, you can actually get a special pen that goes along with it for all weather. Um, just wanted to show you also some examples of pages. This page here is a black skimmer. Um, this is actually from way back in 2002. So I was 11 years old when I sketched this. So I did this when I was at Assateague National Seashore off the coast of Maryland. And it's good when you're sketching, you know, not only to sketch the bird, but also to label it with interesting things that you notice, like plumage characteristics, field marks, anatomy, behavior. So of course, skimmers, they, um, or, or maybe you don't know, skimmers feed by taking their lower mandible through the top of the water and going along, flying along until they feel a fish, and then they snap their lower bell up to catch it. So this is a really fun observation um, to watch. So I was watching these skimmers flying around looking for fish, and that's a really good opportunity for sketching because at that time, I actually remember, even though this was a very long time ago, um, there were a lot of skimmers flying around, so I had plenty of opportunities to sketch. So it's good to set yourself up when you're practicing for opportunities to really see birds for a long time, especially when you're first starting out. Because if you try to sketch, you know, something like a hummingbird that's maybe going to zoom by and then leave, that's going to be a lot more tricky. But if you're sketching something like ducks or shorebirds that are hanging around for a long time, then you'll have more time to observe them. And then, you know, the way this particular notebook is set up, it has one side, you can put a sketch or a photo, and information like the common and Latin name. And then it's nice, it kind of sets it up for you. It has date, time, weather, location, and then you can add some notes down here. And I do like to take a lot of notes. So it's good to have some format to your notes when you're field sketching. The writing is also very important. So, you know, field sketching is just something, um, if you're just starting out, it's something that you can give a try and see how you like it. People like to set up their field journals in different ways. You know, some people prefer more sketching and some prefer more writing. It's all about what's going to help you to become a better observer when you're out in the field birding. I'll show you just a couple more examples. So, when you're sketching also, um, it's good to vary the perspectives and distances of birds that you are drawing. So, for example, here I was hawk watching, um, and these are turkey vultures, which were way off in the distance. All I could see were these little V shapes way far away. So I wanted to, to show their flight shape because they hold their wings up in kind of a dihedral, a V shape, which helps them to be very efficient flyers. And then I saw some other birds that day. It was a really good day. Um, this shorthand here is the four letter code for different bird species. So like great blue heron, for example. And then I have a picture of a heron here. And a sandhill crane, S-A-C-R means sandhill crane. So shorthand like that can be helpful um, if you know that, that kind of shorthand, you know, because you can fit more notes onto your page. And then I described the bird. So this is just a silhouette of a sandhill crane, but I described what I was seeing to help me remember. And then some of these notes, I'll admit, this is a teaching page, so I, I have been using this page to help teach people, but, you know, if you if there's a specific species that maybe you're seeing for the first time, or you've only seen it a few times, it can be really helpful to take just as many notes as you can on things you notice. And, and that can also be supplemented by things you find in your field guide. <laughs> or your app, maybe your Merlin ID app, or another 
identification app that you are using. And then, you know, again, I wanted to include a bunch of perspectives. So I'm comparing the golden eagle's shape to the bald eagle when it's coming in head on. The golden eagle is going to hold its wings up higher and be more in a V shape, almost like a turkey vulture, but not quite as strongly. Whereas the bald eagle here has more of a, a plank shape to it, flat wings going straight out from the body. So those are just a few examples. I included that day's count here. Let me show you one more page. Actually, maybe two more. So this is a nice one showing the broad wing talk. And again, I supplemented um, the, the drawing here with some notes. So this is a nice analogy I like to use, candle flame wing shape. It's very tapered at the end, but the whole shape of that wing is almost like a candle flame. It's very tapered at the end here, but it bulges out in the middle right there. So those kinds of things can be really helpful with ID. And then I also sketched the broad wings, the broad wing talks that were flying very high up in the sky as well, just to show what that looks like. So one more page here, I wanted to talk a little bit about documenting rarities. So if you see a bird that is rare or that you think might be rare, it's a good idea to take as many notes as you possibly can um, that, might, that might help you with that identification. So for example, the time that you see it, how long did you see it, what was the lighting like, how far away was it? And then you can also include a sketch. So I was viewing the swallow-tailed kite up in New York through a scope. It was quite far away. So draw what you see, you know, don't draw what you think should be there. Like don't draw straight from the field guide. Try to draw right when you're out there in the field. Because, you know, depending on the lighting and how far away it is, different birds are going to look different. And that kind of documentation can be really helpful if you're not able to get a photo of the bird. So if you want to go to a rarities committee and tell them that you saw this bird, you know, you want to have as much documentation as you possibly can, especially if you weren't able to get a photo. Okay. Just gonna check something real quick. I want to make sure that everybody was able to get on because I see three people are here right now. Just one second. And Tim, if you're here, if you could just comment on the video that would be awesome just so i know that you're able to get on we'll just take one second Yeah, it looks like he's not on here. So just give me just give me a second and then we'll get started.
All right, I'm sorry about that. Just working out some logistical issues to make sure this video is getting shared where it needs to be. Um, so just a few other tips and resources. One resource that I really like to use is called the Law's Guide, there we go, <laughs> The Law's Guide to Drawing Birds by John Muir Laws. So he's an amazing bird artist, and he also has a lot of free resources and Zoom classes and things like that. If you Google search him, he has a really awesome website, not just for field sketching birds, but also for field sketching all kinds of things, including plants and other wildlife and things like that. Okay. Oh good, it looks like maybe Tim is on now. If you're on Tim, just add a comment and say hi, so that way I'll know. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start out with sketching our green heron. So I'll show you guys the photo and just a few things about it before we get started. So we're going to begin by doing a sketch of the overall body shape and then we're going to add some color. And this is a really nice one to draw because waders, you know, when you're out in the field, they're a really good one to practice drawing because a lot of times they'll sit very still, you know, they're very patient hunters. So you may have an opportunity to sketch them without them moving around very much. And while it is good to sketch birds that move around a lot, you shouldn't really start with that. Um, people who didn't hear my mentioning that earlier, um, because, you know, that will kind of overwhelm you if you start trying to draw something like a hummingbird or a warbler that doesn't sit very still. So when you're starting out, it's, it's good to, to begin with things like ducks, shorebirds, waders, things that are gonna be more still and easier to draw. So set yourself up for success is a good way to look at it. And also remember, field sketching is a tool and it's a way to help your observation skills. It's not all about, you know, getting this amazing, beautiful, pretty picture. Like you saw with some of my examples, um, or if you're just getting on, I'll show you again some of my examples. They are not these amazing <laughs> drawings. They're just like quick sketches silhouettes and things like that. Whatever helped me at the time with identification. So it's really about drawing what you see and about becoming a better observer, not about trying to be this amazing artist. Um, as John Muir Laws likes to say, it's really a numbers game. So the more you practice, the more drawings you do out in the field the more um, your drawings are going to reflect what you're seeing. But yeah, don't put pressure on yourself. Just try to have fun and use it as a way to, to help yourself become a better observer. So to start with this green heron, what I'm going to do to begin, you can get your pencils ready, is have a fairly sharp pencil. So it's nice to have a pencil sharpener on hand, too. I like um, this Faber-Castell Polychromo sharpener because it has different sizes, you know, for different size colored pencils. And you're going to just start by drawing a balance line. So this hair in here is at a bit of an angle. I'm going to try to replicate that angle here. Just overall. And it's good to draw fairly lightly. I'm going to be drawing a little bit darker than I normally would. Just because I want to make sure that everybody can see it on the screen over Facebook Live. So, also, you want to draw nice and big. So try to fill your page as much as you possibly can. But once you get that balance line in, it's good to start with the body so we can position it and make sure that our bird isn't going to go off the edge of the page because we don't want that either. 
Um, so I took my printout and I'm actually doing some measurements just to make sure I get the proportions about right. But since you probably do not have the photo unless you pulled it off the event page, you can just watch me and get the overall proportions drawn in here, okay? So the back comes down like this, and we're just doing very, very basic shapes because we don't want to start in with details straight away. We want to begin with the basic shapes and then add details. So the body shape is kind of like this. It tapers to the end here. And it's like that. And we want to make sure we leave enough space up here for the head and also some space down at the bottom for the legs as well. So the head comes up like this. And I'm going to draw an oval for the head. Leaving enough space for the bell also. And then connect the head to the body with some lines for the neck also. And the neck comes down like this and around, okay? Also gonna do a little width measurement here. Oopsies. So yeah, if you do have a printout or a photo and you're just practicing, you know, in, in your house or in your studio, you can take measurements to help you, but I would definitely recommend um, practicing drawing without doing that also. So when I say measurements, what I mean is taking my pencil and saying, okay, the bill is from here to here and then measuring like that, okay? And then once I have that measurement, I go in like this and make a mark to show how long the bill is. But you know, when, when you're in the field, you're not gonna be able to do that. So it's, it's good to practice eyeballing things as well. So no need to get discouraged, you know, if you don't get it quite exactly the proportion you want it to be. But one tip that can help you a bit with that is let's say okay here's the head here and the body and I want to get these proportions so I can say okay the body if I measure the head like that how many heads long is the body so I can go one two almost three so let's check it against the picture because I think my measurements are a little off my body looks a little large one, one, two, three. Yeah, it's just a little bit too long. So if I notice that, I can go like this and shorten it just a little bit. And that is something also that you can eyeball when you're out in the field. Okay. So next, I'm going to add in the legs. And it's, it's important when you're drawing legs to look at where they're positioned on the body. Because if you make them too far forward or too far backward, your bird's going to look kind of off balance. So on the leg, you have these feathers up at the top here that are covering part of it, and then the leg comes down like this. And I am kind of going off the page, but that's all right. The toes come down here. We can focus a little more on this leg, which comes out like that. And it's interesting, you know, um, some people don't realize when you're drawing a bird's leg or looking at the leg, actually this long part down here is um, basically the ankle, and then you have the toes coming off like this. And herons have very long toes. In this particular photo, the toes are kind of coming off the side of this log here. 
But I'll just draw in the corner, you know, if you if you wanted to get a better sense of what their leg and foot looks like. You've got this part here, and then you have it's called a nisodactyl toe arrangement, which is what most birds have. They have three toes in the front, and then they have one toe in the back here. But there are some birds that have zygodactyl toes, which means two in the front two in the back. So woodpeckers have that. Owls have that. And a cool thing about owls is they can actually rotate one toe forward so that it becomes um, an esodactyl. So they can switch between the two, which is pretty neat. And then there are some birds, like swifts, that have all four toes in the front like that. And that's called pamprodactyl. And they're actually not able to perch upright, so they cling to, like, the sides of cliffs and things like that, which is pretty neat. So just a few side facts. <laughs> and then this guy, I want to see again, he's on this piece of wood here, so you can sketch that in as well. These toes are coming around like this. And then this leg is kind of on the other side, or it is on the other side. Oh, and also I'm using, it's just this little like a makeup brush, a soft brush to brush the eraser crumbs off. I like to have that. You don't necessarily need to have it when you're doing field sketching, but I definitely use it for studio art a lot because it makes it so you don't create any little smudges on your drawing. So now I'm going to add in the eye. So it's important for the eye to look at its positioning on the head. So how far it is from the front of the face and also like how far down it is from the top of the head as well and its relation to the bell. So it's pretty close to the bell. Actually, I should move it down slightly. And I will say also that um, I'm the kind of person who's extremely, extremely detail oriented. So that's kind of reflected with my drawings, but you don't have to be that way. You know, drawing is what it should be to help you, you know? So everybody's going to have a different style. You don't have to be um, like super nitpicky about getting things exactly right. So now I'm starting to draw the wing. Oh, and by the way, uh, please do let me know if you have any questions. You can type those into the comments. And I can't tell if, if Tim, if you're here, but... It would be awesome if you could just add a comment and say hello if you are here. Just so I can make sure that the video was shared successfully. So this is the shoulder. And then the wing has almost like this kind of teardrop shape. I'll show you again here. It comes around like that. And then down. And this area up here is just the back. Okay. The nice thing about this photo, too, is that the feathers are outlined really nicely. So it can be helpful to practice with, with birds that have their feathers outlined really nicely like this. Because they have, at the edge of the feather, there's kind of this yellow. That way you can see each individual wing feather really, really well. Okay, so now that we've gotten pretty far along, we can erase our balance line and some of our other guidelines that we don't need anymore. Like this line here, just to help clean up the drawing a little bit. Have a nice green heron. And let's say you were drawing this bird 
when you're out in the field um, and it moved, one thing that you can do is have a few different drawings going on your page at the same time. So if you see the heron facing one way, you know, you could draw it facing like this, and then if it turns around, you have another drawing going here that you can work on, and you can kind of, this does not look like a heron, but that's okay. You can kind of bounce back and forth between the two drawings as the bird moves around. But even if it does move, you know, a lot of times when they're fishing, they're not going to go very far. So you'll just be able to work on two things at once, which is a nice way to do it. All right, so we have all the basic shapes in here. Um, the other thing that we can do is outline a few of these feather groups. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Up here on the wing, we have the coverts. So the lesser coverts is kind of this group up here. Then you have some of the median coverts down here. And once you get to the bottom of the wing here, these longer feathers are going to be the flight feathers, which have coverts as well. So this group here, it's a little tricky to see, but there are the primary coverts and then there are the secondary coverts which are covering those long flight feathers, the primaries and the secondaries. And to give you a better sense of what I mean, I'm just gonna do another little side drawing here, okay? If the wing was out and extended like this, the coverts would be up here. You'd have the lesser and the, and the median in this area here. And then you would have this little group here. I'm going to shade this in darker. These are the primary coverts, secondary coverts. So that's shaded in darker. And then finally, you have these long skinny primary feathers here. And then these secondaries here, okay? So those are individual feathers that I separated. All right. So that's, that's the basic appearance of a wing. Depending on what kind of bird you're drawing, it might look a little bit different for, for various different species. But, you know, like the shape and size of feathers will look different for different species. So the next thing we can do is just outline a few of the markings. Oh, and I'll also add here this nostril or the nair, which is kind of this long skinny line. And then you have this little area between um, the eye and the bill that is actually skin that doesn't have feathers on it. You can sketch in the pupil. And we've got this little green cap, which we can outline can add a little bit more texture to the top of the head like this. Just some basic texture of those feathers coming down like that. And then we also have some stripes here. So we can just do a basic outline and we're, we're going to color, we're going to add color to this, which will define it a little bit better. All right. And now Yes, we can move on to this wing here, which I began to talk about. So I'm going to just sketch in not the individual feathers, but just the outline of the different groups. We have the lesser coverts up here, the median coverts, which come down to about here. And then you have this little kind of triangle of primary coverts here. Band of secondary coverts. And finally, the primaries and the secondaries. And then this other wing is kind of overlapping over the back as well. And I'm sorry if that was 
a little much to take in at once. I would recommend definitely looking at um, David Sibley's website. If you search David Sibley, he has really nice pictures of bird anatomy that you can take a look at. That'll give you a, a good sense of the wing structure of most birds, okay? So now we're gonna start adding some color. And to do that, when I'm using colored pencils, what I like to do is erase the graphite until you can barely see it. So there's just a guideline there to help you see where you need to draw. But especially when I'm drawing things like in very light colors, such as the yellow I'm about to use, I don't want that graphite to show through in the drawing. And it doesn't really matter if you're trying to just do a really quick field sketch. But it's kind of honestly just a personal preference. I don't like to have that graphite showing through. Especially if I'm doing, you know, like a studio drawing. But what I'm going to do is just shade in that eye with a very light yellow colored pencil. Um, you know what? I'm going to use actually cadmium yellow. Which is this one here. And, you know, you might have colors that are named different things if you're using colored pencils to sketch along. Which is totally fine, but you can just take a look at the pencil that I'm showing here and, and try to get a color that's around about the same, you know. And if you are not using colored pencils, you're just using a regular drawing pencil or a number two HB pencil, what you can do is when I'm using lighter colors, you can shade lightly. So for this eye, I actually would barely shade at all. I would have my pencil a little bit dull and just barely shade that in, kind of like this. That's the pupil, which is dark, but for the inner part of the eye, I'm just going to barely shade that using the side of my pencil, okay? And another thing I like to use sometimes for blending is uh, like a Q-tip or a paper stump. That can be helpful too. Let me zoom in a little bit on the head so you can see better. There we go. And now I can add in that pupil using black. So this is just a black pencil. Sometimes, in, in this particular instance, it's not really that obvious, but sometimes there's a little bit, I should say most of the time, there's a little bit of a light spot. It's less obvious in this picture because it's in the yellow area, but sometimes I'll add it in with my electric eraser like this. <laughs> If it's subtle, um, if it's a really bright spot, a bright reflection in the eye, it's good to just leave it without any color on there. That way you don't, you know, accidentally muddy it up and get it darker than you want it to be. Now I'm going to outline the eye very lightly using this black. And I want it to be pretty sharp. Next, there's some yellow around the eye, so I'm going to shade that in, again with the yellow. But there are also some shadows. So, I just want to show you, when I'm using colored pencils, I have a nice array of grays here. And on the left, oop, let me just put them down, zoom out a little. On the left, I have cold grays, and then once you get over to here, where my finger is, these are warm grays, and if you can see the comparison, the cold grays are a little more bluish, whereas the warm grays have more of like a warm brownish um, tone to them, or yellowish tone to them. So, drawing birds, you're often going to be using gray pencils. It's good to look at what you're seeing, or in this case, the photo, um, 
and see does your gray tone or your shadow look like it's cool or does it look warm so in this instance it's kind of hard to tell but i would probably use a dark warm gray like this one here and for these polychromos pencils faber castell polychromos you're gonna have um pencils that are numbered one to six for the different shades so the the higher the number the darker that gray is going to be and if you're using prismacolor which is another really nice brand it's in percentages so the higher the percentage the darker the color is going to be just going to put this little shadow here the skin around the eye if I want to blend that, I can take my yellow again. So kind of an in-between gray and blend it into the yellow a little bit. Okay. And then I'm just going to lightly outline that area. And the hair, and you'll notice, has a little bit of an eye ring as well. So this thin area of yellow that doesn't have any feathers. So that's also going to be shaded in yellow. If you want to kind of make your eye have more of a round appearance too, you can bring in some darker yellows. It might not show up very well over Facebook, but I'm just darkening the edge here you can use some gray as well okay so next let's work on the bill again I'm gonna erase that graphite just until I can barely see it but it's still there as a guide and I'm gonna use some cold grays for the bill because if you look at this photo here it's kind of bluish along the top, and then it has some yellow on the lower mandible of the bell. So you can actually add even a touch of blue. The sky blue right here is what I'm going to use, along with a very light cold gray. I'm going to use cold gray three. So we're going to mix those two together using very light pressure. So a little bit of that cold gray three, and then just a tiny bit of sky blue. To help me mix those together, the other thing I can do is take a white pencil and go over the top, and that will help to blend. And reduce the um, sp spots of white showing through. Now again, some of these things are details that you might not want to focus on so much in the field. This is more if you're doing an in-depth drawing, but you know, either a quick sketch or an in-depth drawing, both are really good things to practice. I would recommend trying out both. So it's, it's good to vary your practice quite a bit. You know, if you're sitting by the edge of a pond and you see a heron, you might be able to sit there for like an hour and do a really in-depth sketch, which is really a beneficial thing to do. So then for the lower part of the bell, I'm going to use some yellow. You know, whereas if you look at some of those sketches I showed you from hawk watching, those are much quicker sketches, which are also beneficial to practice. So that when you see something that's just flying by quickly, you are practiced in being able to document that also. So the next thing I'm going to do is take a Payne's gray, which is a really dark gray, almost black, and just add some of the darker areas into the bell now. Like the nostril here. And then this line between the upper and lower mandible of the bell. 
So, you know, when I was, when I drew in this shape, I should have mentioned earlier, you know, it's very important to look at bill shape. And the shape of a heron's bill is like a spear. So it's very pointed at the end. And then it's fairly thick here when you get closer to the face and to the eye. You know, all birds have a very functional bell shape, depending on what they eat. So drawing something like this is a way to help you remember some of those features. Especially if you're the kind of person who writes things down to remember them, and that really helps you with your memory, sketching is probably going to be really beneficial to you. So I'm taking a medium gray to, to um, just outline this bottom edge. Because, yeah, I know I'm definitely that way. And if that's how your memory works, you know, getting it down on paper, whether that's in the form of words or a drawing or both, that can really, really help your observation skills. All right. There's a little bit more shading I can add in spots. Like right in here. Might even use some black. Some of the shadows are a little bit dark. So getting um, the shape that you see on that bill is going to be a really a good way to um, portray portray that bird's appearance and kind of personality as well in the eye. Those parts are really important features on the bird. And you know, with, with something like a heron's bill that's really long, be careful to try and draw just what you see rather than what you think is there because sometimes if we see features on a bird that um, we think are really interesting, like a really long bill or something like that, you might say, oh my gosh, okay, it has a bill like this, and then realize, oh, wait a second, I've gotten far too carried away <laughs> with that. So that's definitely a thing, a thing that can happen. So again, try to look at, okay, how long is this bill in relation to the head? Try to just focus on what's there. And that's really can be a hard thing to do because your brain will want to put in extra notes and extra things. <laughs> so now I'm going to add in this area on the top of the head, which is a nice iridescent green. So let's talk a little bit about drawing iridescence, which is a really fun thing to do. Um, what you want to start with is the lightest color that you see. So I'm going to begin with so many greens to choose from. I'm going to use this dark phthalo green. It's called dark phthalo green, but it's actually not that dark. And I'm going to use just very light pressure and just shade in the top of the head here. You can also try to get in some of this texture on the back of the head as well. Try to brush away any eraser crumbs because if you start shading in and if you press too hard with your pencil, that can kind of get the eraser crumbs to get stuck on your paper. Have these feathers coming down here, kind of long plumes. But I'm using light pressure, kind of the side of my pencil right here. It's sharp, but I'm using the side of the pencil. And then, let's see, I'm going to add a little bit of blue to this as well. So with iridescence, usually, you know, even if it looks green, 
If you look closely, you'll notice other tones in there as well, sometimes blue or maybe even yellow. And getting some of that in there is important to help portray that shine. And iridescence is all about layering. You know, most birds that have green plumage or blue plumage, it's not actually pigment. It's all about how the light is being reflected off the feathers, the structure of the feathers. Which is pretty cool to think about. You know, like if this heron was in the dark, it, the top of the head would look more black. So now what I'm going to do is start bringing in darker tones using this pine green here or any kind of dark green that you may have. And I'm going to get this pretty sharp. Because to really show iridescence, you want a lot of contrast. Okay, so I'm looking at where the shadows are and we've got some shadows here. I wonder if I can, let's see. I'm gonna try to get this so that you can see both at the same time. There we go. So we've got this shadow here. And then we also have some lines coming in like this. Shadows in between some of the feathers. So it's very important when you have shine going on to, to show that contrast. And truly getting it to look iridescent, that can take a lot of layers sometimes. You might even have to come back in with your eraser and erase some of the really bright spots, like up in here. And also when you're using colored pencils, you know, don't get discouraged if at first it doesn't look quite how you want it to look, you know, because it's, it's all about layering and layering. And those different layers will work together to eventually create the details that you want. It's, it's a very fun process, I think. And you can vary the amount of pressure that you use with your pencil to get different effects and, and different amounts of shadow. And if I want to deepen some of those shadows, I can also take in Pencils like this dark indigo here, which is a really, really good pencil to use for shadows because it will help to add to the dimension of the shadows. You can use pretty dark pressure to get some of these deeper shadows in. And it's all about getting that contrast between the really dark and the really bright. That's what's going to make it look shiny. Okay, and that's just a basic beginning to that. Got this little bit of shadow behind the eye. We also have some contrast here. Okay. I did make my eye a little bit higher up than I wanted, but that's okay. Got this shadow here. Okay, and then we also have some shadows in this area that are pretty dark. You can use black or like a dark brown for those areas. So now let's move on to the neck, which has some really beautiful coloration there. And for that, I'm going to use... Um, some really reddish brown colors. So again, we're going to start out with um, 
the lightest color that we see. So the light is coming from this direction, you know, my, see my pencil is pointing down like this. The light is shining down onto the back of the neck. And then we have some shadows, very dark shadows in this area, which is nice because it shows the texture of these feathers really beautifully. So for my base layer here, what I'm going to use is um, burnt ochre. This color here matches that fairly nicely. Erase some of my graphite guiding lines. I can barely see it. And then we're just going to shade in that entire neck with burnt ochre except for the stripes. So we're going to leave those stripes isolated. Okay. So we have this little white area here that we're going to leave isolated. I'm going to shade the whole rest in burnt ochre. We have this little patch here. And then you have this long stripe that comes down this way. I'm actually going to um, move this just because I want to make sure it focuses properly for this part. It looks like it's getting a little out of focus. There we go. Sometimes it wants to focus on the other paper, I think, because it's more colorful. But yeah, we can shade all the way down here. And it's nice to have a fairly sharp pencil. That way you don't have too many white spots and showing through in your paper. And if you do, you can go over the top of it with a lighter color using pretty hard pressure. That's called burnishing to help um, get rid of the white spots. But you know, if you're doing a field sketch, it's it's not really that important if it's, if it's kind of a quick sketch. Because you're wanting to just get the basic colors and tones in there. You know, if I was doing a studio drawing, I would I would spend hours on this area up here. But field sketching most of the time is just getting about getting basic impressions. And this russet color goes down to like around about here. Then we have some more on the other side of the stripe right here. So if you're drawing this right now and you've never drawn a green hair and you may say to yourself, wow, I'm starting to notice things about it that I didn't notice before. So that can be really helpful, even if it's even if it's a bird that you see very frequently, like if it's something you see every day, like a cardinal at your feeder or sparrows at your feeder. Drawing those common birds is is a really good way to practice. And it will help you to appreciate them more, too, and notice things that you didn't notice before. So then to start bringing in the darker areas in the brown, I'm going to use this terracotta color, which is pretty orange. And it's a little darker than that burnt ochre. So this is sort of my mid-tone that I'm using here. The darker areas. And 
And you can get a little texture by having a pretty sharp pencil and doing these textury strokes around the edges of those stripes. These feathers are quite textured. It's, it's almost like you're drawing fur pretty much. The only difference is the feather barbs are going to be going in different, different directions more so than fur does because the shape of a feather is going to be like this. You have the central barb in the middle and then you have barbs coming off the sides like that, okay? Whereas in fur, if this was, let's say, a dog, the fur would be going probably more in one direction unless it's a really furry, uh, curly dog or something like that. Rather than getting these barbs that go in different directions. So for the base layer, you know, I didn't worry too much about that. But when I start bringing in my darkest tones, we'll start getting more into the, the texture here. Okay, so that's the, that's like the mid-tone. It's also a little shadow here. And yeah, I shouldn't say, I mean, fur doesn't always just go so much in one direction. It'll go in different directions, but the barbs, it's kind of like sharply defined differences within a small area, if that makes sense. Because you have the central shaft of the feather, you have some barbs coming off one way and some coming completely off the other way. So I'll show you here. You can kind of see that. You have some here going in this direction. And then there's some going that way as well. It's, it's really actually pretty subtle in this picture. Especially because you're going into the shadow here. But on these feathers here, you know, the middle is going to be right here. And then you have barbs coming like that. And then you have others going off this side, if that makes sense, okay? So they're going in two abrupt different directions. That's a better way to say it, you know, it's abrupt changes in direction going on. So a lot of these feathers, of course, on the neck are going to be overlapping too. What I'm going to do for these shadows is, hmm, I'm going to use Caput Mortem Violet, which is like a, a deep, almost purpley brown, to get in those really dark shadows in here. And you might not have that exact pencil, which is totally fine. Other good options would be like Burnt Sienna mixed with a dark umber or any other kind of dark brown. You can even add a little bit of violet as well. But this is a really nice pencil to use. And these Faber-Castell Polychromos are my favorite brand of colored pencils. I really like them because they don't break very easily. Another excellent brand is the Prismacolors. And those should be available, both of those brands I think are available pretty much worldwide. The Polychromos are nice for if you do a lot of drawing because they last so, so long. When they start to get really small, you can use what's called a pencil holder. Stick it in there and then you'll be able to use your pencil until it's almost gone. <laughs> this pencil here is, is a Luminance pencil, which is a different brand, but I also really like these. They're almost more like pastels. They're, they will bring in pretty solid colors, especially like this black one here. Yeah, see, it says permanent color. So this black is a really, really deep, dark 
color there. So it's good for when you when you want to get dark shadows in. We also have we have a shadow here that has kind of an abrupt edge. You don't want to outline that shadow because if you make a hard line here, it will look a little bit too artificial, but you can just start shading in that area here. And then you'll get a nice shadow. And then to get those really dark areas, you can use like a dark brown or a dark sepia for that. Okay. And you may even want to brighten up certain parts using something like a cadmium orange for those really light areas. Mix that with the burnt ochre and the terracotta and you'll get some nice color going on here. Some nice rufous. Such a pretty bird. Alright. So that's just the basics. Could go on and add some more layers, but you'll see here that I had some suggestion of lines to show the shadows in between the feather barbs. Okay. So now let's go and do this area down here and then we'll move on to the wing. So once we get down into the belly area, it's kind of like this greenish brown that we have going on. So we can mix some colors for that. I'm going to mix, it's almost like a, a greenish gray actually in this particular lighting. I'm going to mix warm gray too with olive green yellowish for that area. Okay, and again, if you don't have those exact colors, that's totally fine. To get an olive green, um, you can mix light brown with light green, and that will work pretty nicely. So I'm going to start with those lighter colors, but I'm also going to add some darker as well. So I want to make sure I get those shadows in. And we are going to focus, <laughs> just so you know mostly, on this bird. And for the other two, we're going to do some more brief sketches. So you can see some of, some of the different sketching styles that you might want to use. So I'm just getting that warm gray, too making a base layer here. And then you have a little feathery texture coming off the, the back of the legs as well. And then it really ends right here. The tail is pretty much covered up by the wings <laughs> at this angle. They don't have a very big tail. <laughs> And then I'm taking the olive green yellowish and just adding that. If I want to blend the two together, I can go over the top with a white pencil using harder pressure to blend my base layer a little bit. Or you might want to use like a Q-tip or a paper stump. It's another good tool for blending. But try, um, when you're doing the, even the base layer, even though you're not getting a lot of texture in here, try to stay in the, in the general direction of the feathers. Because if you start going, you know, straight up and down or something like that, it's not going to flow as nicely that, you know, the, the bird will look kind of funky. 
Um, and then we're going to start adding in our shadows using a pretty dark gray. So I'm going to use the warm gray six. And try to get that shadow blended in to be about the same shade that we have going on in this area up here. And then you might say, oh, you know, in the wing, I actually have one feather coming down here, which we can count for that as well. Shadow goes to about here. And then have a little bit of texture here. Some of those leg feathers coming up over the belly feathers. And again, if you wanted to deepen that shadow, you could add in like um, some dark indigo. This is a really nice one to use. And blended with other colors, you know, it won't actually look that bluish. It'll just help to deepen it and make that shadow nice and dark. And that's an important tip because sometimes people don't think about that. They think, well, this doesn't appear to be, um, doesn't appear to be blue, so I'll just use gray. Dark indigo mixed with brown is also really nice for black areas if you're trying to darken your, your black shadow, your really dark shadows. Or for like um, the pupil in the eye, you can also do that as well. Got another little shadow back here. Okay. And I could go in and add more layers, but that's a that's a good start there. And by more layers, I just mean a little bit more texture here. Showing the feather texture. For the legs, I'm gonna use like a dark greenish yellow color. A good one to use for that would be something like this. Light yellow ochre. Like a brownish yellow. So I'm just gonna shade in that base for the legs and the toes. And then we can add some shadow to that, again using the warm gray six. And you can't really see it that well in this instance, but oftentimes legs will have, I shouldn't say oftentimes, they always have scales, but you can't always see them that well. can see a little bit of the outlines of those scales here. So if there are details that you can't see, it's okay to leave them out. Like, don't try to make up things that aren't there when you're field sketching. If you're interested in being able to see something a little better, you can look at a field guide or a birding app. And then that'll get give you a better sense of the details later on. But you know, it's important when you're IDing birds 
to get a sense of IDing them when they're distant as well as close up. For example, you know, a, a bird guide that I really like, there's one called Hawks at a Distance. And it doesn't have like beautiful, incredible photos of up close hawks. It has these tiny speck pictures of hawks that are way off in the distance. And I can tell you from experience as a hawk watcher that that's often how they're going to look. So I'm just adding in the little claws there as well. Okay. So let's just draw um, the back feathers and also some of the wing feathers. I'm not going to draw all the wing feathers just so we can move on to some of our other sketches. But I want to give you a sense of how to draw them. So for the back, we're going to do a base layer in, let's see, I think I'll use that dark phthalo green again it's pretty similar to the color of the top of the head and just shade in that whole back for my base layer got a little texture here you can show of the um the brown neck feathers overlapping that green back some very pretty coloration going on here then you have some dark use this it's kind of a dull dark green called chrome oxide green can outline some of these plumes which are long skinny feathers coming down over the back so I'm just outlining some of those and then I'll come in and add more shadows as you get further along down the back I have quite a bit of reflected light here so you can add some fairly bright blue like this light phthalo blue and mix it in with the green also. And you might want to do a little bit of erasing to emphasize some of those highlights too. Okay. So, yeah, that's just a start on the back, but you can come in and add some more plumes along there. Let's talk a little bit about the wing feathers next. So in this particular instance, it's really nice because individual feathers are outlined really well here. So what I would suggest is taking a fairly light pencil, the yellow, taking that pencil and outlining individual feathers. Um, I'm not going to do that because I do not think it's going to show up well for Facebook Live, but that's what I'd recommend. Um, instead, I'm going to use green and then add in the yellow. Either way really works, but... So you've got these overlapping feathers that are like scales here. So you want to look at the shape of those feathers, basically in rows. And you have these light edges. Just going to do a few of these. And then you're going to shade them in with green. And I would start with the lightest color, then you can add shadows to individual feathers. With something dark like a pine green. And that will also emphasize the contrast between that um, ochre colored yellow and that green here. Okay. So that's just a basic start and you know those those 
feathers are going to look the same pretty much in coloration as you go down here. You just might need to alter some of, or you will need to alter some of the shading that goes on because along this edge you're going to have some deeper shadows. But let me just outline some of these feathers to give you a sense of how the shape changes as you go down. As you go down the wing like this, the feathers are going to begin to get a little more pointy and you're going to be able to see more of them. They don't overlap quite as much and they're also larger. Get down here, they get quite pointy down here. Okay. And if you want to continue drawing this, the photo is, is attached to the event. Okay, so you'll be able to continue drawing this. And I'd love to see what you drew. Um, you can definitely share on social media. You can, you can send your drawing to, uh, as a message to my page, or you can share it directly to my page can also share it with the hashtag global birding to celebrate this event. Then as you get down here to these coverts, um, you've got these very long feathers here. Some of them are overlapping quite a bit. The primary coverts are in this little stack here kind of. And then you also have a feather coming down like this, which is the Alula. That's a really interesting feather. Um, it actually helps to act as brakes when the bird is slowing down and landing. Um, it's kind of like, you know, on an airplane, as it's landing, it'll lift the flaps on the wings just to help break up air and have, have like a smooth landing. It's the same idea with the Alula on a bird's wing. So then finally you have these really long feathers at the end here. So these are the secondaries more towards the back. You can also see the other wing kind of overlapping a little. And then the primaries, which are like this, kind of stacked along here. Okay, and you're not necessarily going to be able to see all of them because they're overlapping. But most birds have 10 primaries and they'll have like between 12 and 14 secondaries much of the time. It depends on the species and, you know, how long the wings are and things like that. Okay. But there you can have a general sense of, of sketching a green heron. Let's move on now, in our last few minutes, to the snow bunting next. And for the snow bunting, we're just going to do a quick impressional sketch, okay? Move some of my pencils over a bit. So, the snow bunting also has a lot of pattern patterning going on. Um, I'm going to need all these greens. However, let me just show you. If you were to see a snow bunting, they're pretty active birds. They're not going to necessarily sit still for you like a heron and not move very much. So it's a good idea to also practice sketching things a little bit more quickly. Okay. So let's say you see this bird out in the field and you, you're not really sure what it is, but a few things might jump out at you. Um, of course, this huge area of white here along the leading edge of the wing, that might be something that you'd really want to include in your sketch. The bell shape. Uh, so these, are, these guys are seed eaters a lot of the time, so they have this bell for... Um, 
um, cracking open seeds. And also this modeling on the back. There's a lot of black and brown and white modeling, as well as um, in this non-breeding plumage, you have these beautiful russet color colors here, russet colors of orange. So to get the overall shape of this bird, I'm going to draw again a balance line. But I'm going to do a little bit more of, of a quick impression sketch, okay? So you've got the body here. It's a fairly chubby songbird. Then the head, they have a really short kind of neck. So you have this little shape here for the head. Bell off the front is very conical. Think about the placement of the eye in relation to the bell when you add the eye in. And then, got the tail, which has a little fork to it. That's another field mark that might be helpful to you. These birds like to travel a lot in flocks, so if you saw a flock, you might want to also include as a side image a little drawing of what the flock looks like in flight. I often see them in the distance when I see them um, here here in New England. You see them in the wintertime a lot. Like, they like to hang out in open areas and parking lots sometimes even. So it's good to take note of the habitat where you're seeing birds as well in your field notes. You've got this wing coming across here and overlapping tail. And it's sort of like a teardrop shape. You can see the other one here too. And the two, the two wingtips kind of come to this point here. And then this photo that I'm referencing has um, a nice view of this modeling here on the back too. So let's say you just want to get some of the general field marks in. Got this leg. And it's sitting on a board. You can just see that back toe and that back claw there pretty much. So let's say I just wanted to get in a few field marks to help me remember what this bird looks like. Let's say I was out and about and I didn't have a field guide or a birding app or anything, but I just wanted to get down some of the important characteristics that would help my memory. So on the face, you'll notice it's got this little patch. These are the auricular feathers that um, cover the ears. So it's got this little kind of darker brown and, and burnt rufous colored patch right here. So you might want to include that. So we've got like some burnt ochre and also some dark sepia or dark umber here. It's also dark along the top of the head here, too. The bell is kind of pinkish orange. It's a nice thing to note. I made my bell a little bit too large, but that's okay. Um, if you notice something like that, you can just take a little bit of it off like this. That's a bit better. And then you might want to just shade in the back and show some of the basic modeling that you have going on here. Maybe just using a few colors like black and burnt ochre 
rather than a lot of colors. You just want to get that general impression. And you can, you know, erase some of these guidelines if they're in your way. The balance line is just a nice one to have to get you started because you want to make sure you try to get the angle going on to show that bird's posture. We've got suggestion of these flight feathers you can add. You have some coverts coming down here, which are a bit darker, but then you have this large white patch here. So you can try to get in the border between the dark and the, the white area here. And then to, to really show that contrast also, you have this dark line here along the edge of the white wing patch as well. And then when you get to the tail, you have a little bit of burnt ochre, in the upper tail coverts. And then pretty much a dark tail. If you saw this bird up in the, the far north in the summer, their coloration is going to look different. They're not going to have all this russet coloration they have in, in the non-breeding season. Going to be really just like black and white. The males are, are really quite contrasting, black and white. And then the legs are dark. It's good to make sure that you show leg coloration, especially in like shorebirds and gulls, because that's often an important identifying clue. Not always quite as important in passerines, but it can be sometimes. All right, so that's just a basic sketch of the snow bunting that could help you. And then you might want to label it with things, for example, like white wing patch. Or rufus on side of head. Things like that, okay? And then of course things like location, date, time, weather are really good to include in your field notes also. So lastly, let's do a little sketch of a peregrine. Peregrines are really fast birds, so if you were to sketch a bird flying like this, you might only see it for a few seconds. So that could be even a quicker sketch than what we just did. So let's say this bird was zooming by, um, maybe in migration or if you're sitting on a mountaintop or something, or in the city, they really like skyscrapers. To nest on sometimes and to roost on. And bridges so they have really variable habitat and they have a really wide distribution too in different areas of the world so let's keep this right next to the page while we're drawing um, so basic shape of falcons they have very very pointed wings so to start out with a flying raptor like this you can do a line to show the wings. Oh, you know what? This is on an angle, isn't it? I'm sorry. Slightly angled line. So this is just the angle of the wings, pretty much. And then the body, this. Okay. So now for the shape of the body, it's sort of this tubular shape. 
with the head coming off like that. Oops. Got a very small bill. And in this case, the tail isn't fanned out. It's this rectangle. Sometimes they'll fan their tail more like this, especially if they're soaring. And if you're doing a field sketch and you saw that happen, you could even include, you know, the outline of what the tail looks like fanned versus not. So next for the wing shape, You have this bend at the wrist and then it comes out and it's almost triangular. Okay, so where you have that bend, the secondaries are here and then this pointed part is where the primaries come out. All right, so oftentimes that might be all you see, a silhouette, in which case you can just shade that drawing in. But if you wanted to include some field marks, think about what you notice on this bird. You'll see there's a lot of barring going on because this is an adult bird. An immature would have um, streaking rather than barring on the underside here. So I was just sketching in pencil. Could include some suggestion of this barring on the underside. The feet are here. And then another really prominent thing that you'll notice is um, it looks like sideburns kind of right here so you can sketch that in too and it's very dark it's a pretty prominent field mark and then you have so much bar barring going on here it's pretty consistent between um, these underwing coverts here and then you have the flight feathers coming off like this it's such a uniform shape that you know you can erase these guidelines and bring the feathers in like this but you've almost got a uniform line along that trailing edge and if you're just seeing this bird briefly it might appear that way to you okay but raptor ID you know a lot of it is about is about shape and silhouette more than looking at field marks if you're lucky enough to see field marks, so certainly you can include them in your sketch. And you've got a similar thing going on here. These are the underwing coverts. It's a little bit more bend in this wing. That's a pretty subtle difference though. Then you've got this very pointed shape to the wing. Okay, and then barred undertail coverts. And fairly dark end to the tail here and some of that is you know there's there's some shadow going on here okay all right and yeah i made the head projection a little bit big 
If you notice something like that, you can just erase. And you know, you might try to make the bell larger than it is. Because I think we tend, as humans, to focus on the facial features like the bell a lot. And then make them a little bit too large. Interesting fact about falcons, it's in the past few years recently been discovered, they're actually more closely related to parrots than they are to other diurnal raptors like hawks, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> they discover that through their molt patterns, um, which is pretty neat. And genetic info. All right. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed that class. Um, Please do feel free to share some of your um, sketches, both from today and if you go out tomorrow for Global Birding Weekend and do some sketches actually out in the field. That would be wonderful to see. And you can share those here on Facebook or on Instagram with um, the hashtag Global Birding to show that you're participating in the Global Birding Weekend. And please do check out the Global Birding page um, if you're not watching from that page right now. I know some of you might be watching from my art page. They have a really wonderful event going on, and they're raising money for bird conservation. And you can go out and submit your data to eBird, and they're going to do um, a tally of, you know, different teams, what they've observed, different people, what they've observed, throughout this weekend. So it's a great time to be out and about birding wherever you are in the world. Of course, any time is great for birding. Um, I know here in New England where I am, there's a ton of migration going on. So I'm gonna go out birding um, to Plum Island National Wildlife Ref, I'm sorry, Parker River National Wildlife Refuge tomorrow and try to see some birds. All right, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed this class, and if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the comments. I'll stay on for a little bit longer if you have any questions. And you can also just shoot me a message anytime on my art page here if you have questions or you want to share some of your sketches. If you'd like any help with various techniques. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye.